The main books or things which I have managed to publish in the course of being a professor are much too few. I don't know whether a very few of them really deserve mention. I think perhaps what I should regard as the most important are really in the few public lectures I have given. I also once gave a paper to the Philological Society which was entitled Chaucer as a Philologist, which I think brought into prominence all the things about the 14th century and Chaucer as well as perhaps being of use in textual criticism, which it has been recently noted again, although it was some years since I gave it. I did it together with the help. I'm afraid he did most of the dirty work of the late Eric Valentine Gordon, who was once a pupil of mine. Together we edited and brought first, I think, into prominence, therefore, a remarkable medieval work, superior, I think, to most of what Chaucer wrote, which is now known as Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. And we published together an edition which has held the field since and has now been re-edited by another pupil of mine who has followed me. Professor Norman Davis, who now has it in a paperback. It's a remarkable poem. I propose quite shortly, in fact, I should have done so before, to publish a translation of this poem. I did make a translation, which I have now improved, which was a successful broadcast on the BBC in the early 50s. I think there was a repeat broadcast. I suppose I've done other things, but I can't remember them at the moment. Well, if you want, Beowulf is one of the very few long poems in Anglo-Saxon which deals with the traditions which the English brought with them from their original location in what we should now call Denmark. And it shows a remarkable amount of tradition about ancient Swedish history. It's really rather a document of Swedish history than English, but it happens to be entirely English in its literary style. The only other things I've published which might be called narrative things is a thing that I was once proud of, but don't think so much of now. A thing called Lord and Lady, or Outru and Itron, which is an attempt on my part. I always believe in practicing what you preach. I'd heard so much about this or that story being made of a composition that I thought I'd try and make a story of my own, and see what happens when you try to compound two. This was compounded of two actual modern Breton Lees. It was written in the medieval style and was published in the Welsh Review. But that's all I think I can say about published work, except that I was often a contributor to the old Oxford magazine with stray verses, which have since been remodeled or republished. All kinds of things. Partly because I was employed not only as preparing the rough stuff out of which the editor wrote the articles, but I was particularly employed to do etymologies. And I ran into quite a lot of very interesting etymologies at that time. Winter, walrus, wampum, various things of that kind. It was through having to do the etymology of wampum that I first made any acquaintance with the Algonquin languages of Eastern America and so on. It's a wonderful place, a dictionary. It's like the legal side of philology in which you will get perfectly expert in preparing briefs without really knowing what you're talking about. Well then, eventually a charming man, George Stuart Gordon, G.S. Gordon, who had been a prize fellow at Merton and had become, just before the war, professor of English in the University of Leeds. And when the war was over, he came back and took up his job. And he then began to try and fill up his department. And he, with a great ingenuity, introduced them to the wonderful Oxford term of a reader, which simply really meant that you get an assistant to the professor who's paid rather more than the average lecturer. You won't be interested, probably, when the ancient definition was asked a certain famous Oxford professor who had an impediment in his speech and... One dear lady wanted to know what the difference between a professor was and a reader. And he said, my dear lady, a professor merely professes to read while a reader really reads. Well, I really, really read. And I went under George Gordon, which was a very fortunate thing for me. He gave me a free hand.
and we built up a remarkable medieval and linguistic side in the University of Leeds, which many of my pupils eventually filled many places. One of the most eminent and famous has recently died, the great Professor A. H. Smith of University College London, who was a very considerable scholar, his works in the early English place name society. George Gordon was elected to succeed Professor Raleigh, and I think partly owing to his encouragement, I applied for the Professor of Anglo-Saxonship, which became vacant in Oxford when Professor Craigie went to America. I occupied that chair for 20 years, I suppose from 45, and the year in which Charles Williams died, I removed from Pembroke, where I had been very happy, to Merton as the Merton Professor of English Language and Literature. Too big a job for me, really. On the death of the great scholar Henry Cecil Wilde, I retired, which means to say that I was legally removed from my chair in 1959 at the age of 67, after having been for a brief time the senior professor of this university. I suppose I inherited a certain amount of facility in learning language, which is not very great, much greater by eye and in books than in speaking. I have a fairly good phonetic ear, and I can make phonetic noises of easy languages like jar and so on, sufficiently good to deceive people. The result is that if I make a tentative remark in German, people used to flood me with German, and I go down all hands, you know, sunk. But I'm not a good linguist. The only language I've ever spoken with anything like a colloquial facility for a short while is Spanish. But that's getting blank now. I was bowled over by Gothic because it's an entirely new, though within the Germanic field, entirely new taste. And one of the things that most interfered in my getting a good classical degree in Oxford, I did well enough, I ought to have done better, was unfortunately coming across in Exeter College Library the Finnish language. But is that any kind of explanation? I think you have got to really like things, and perhaps for what you might say are rational reasons ultimately, otherwise you can't put them across. And I think what people have encouraged me to think of that, I usually showed a very intense interest in the lectures I gave. Of course, certain linguistic tendencies are handed down with certain racial varieties or types. I don't know, but I think that the correspondence of my tastes to my ancestry and location is very close. I find that intoxicating and aesthetic and nourishing. At the same time, I wanted to know, I had botany books and I found myself very soon, quite young, being fascinated by classificatory botany, not so much because of its purely scientific and genetic sides, but because it, in many cases, in many large families, it gives you this wonderful impression of the repetition, which even an eye can discern, of an underlying pattern constantly varied, you know. In some of the large classes of flowers, the same pattern is varied. And some, of course, just for fun. They're not in particular. No, not arrogantly. I was quite humble. But if I was told how a Latin meter works, I wanted to write it in English. If I was told when surveying Greek or Latin grammar, I felt I should like to rewrite it so as to make it a bit better in certain points. I always want to imitate every language I've learnt. I first only knew by words like Epaminondas, uh, Leonidas and Aristoteles and things of that kind. I tried to invent a language which would incorporate a feeling of that. It was quite lame. I don't know why one should because one likes Finnish. You should try and invent a language that was like Finnish. Or, uh, of course, when one has learnt a little Welsh and wants to make a I don't know why, but I've always been like that. And also, any story or any legend, I think, I've always wondered how I felt that I could incorporate that and possibly improve it when I put it into a work of my own. But it's had a long history because it started out by being extremely Finnish, which David Masson, who is rather good at these things, detected almost at once by having a bit of it written. It's got some Finnish stuff in it, 
I mean, surinen and so on would catch the ear of anybody, of course. The use of innen and so on is very Finnish, isn't it? Yes, rather beautiful. But it's only good for one line to me. It's, you might say, got a Finnish basis with a certain amount of Greek thrown back and other languages I've learnt since, but harking back, since this is its final form, to what is really my primary love as a good European, the basic European language, Latin. It's got much more Latinized as I've got older. This is how, if I got a voice suitable, I should imagine Gandalf at the Council of Elrond spoke the chief words of the Lord of the Rings, which appear on the head of each volume, one ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all, and in the darkness bind them. Ominous in English, but in the foul language of which they are composed, it runs something like this. The change in the wizard's voice was astounding. Well, I feel that those words are ugly, and I can only offer that as an example of what I find ugly. I find it on the whole most people of the same island, of the same general linguistic background and climate, agree. But actually what really is ugly is so close to what is familiar that it's difficult to ever come across. Most people will agree that I is, on the whole, a pleasant sound. And you will find that in many languages, even in the Eastern ones. But after all, great languages like Sanskrit hadn't in the classical Sanskrit, hadn't got an R, hadn't got an I that was connected with R, and the same is generally true of Japanese. Authors very often tend to describe character, their own character very often, or a character as it appears to them to be. But they also tend to describe characters which are, although they mentally and by sympathy can comprehend, they are not really in their own nature. I think I find... I often describe timid persons like myself. The only saving grace they can have is fortitude, which I don't think I possess myself in a very great degree. I should have retired into the house and asked my mother, but at the same time I should have had no regrets about the necessity of this procedure. Some boys would have either disobeyed or felt that they were being frustrated. If a wizard had come to me, of course, as a small boy, then the situation would be totally different than that in The Hobbit. I was not a free person, nor the organizer of my life, nor the householder, nor anything else, but at the same time I should have found some excuse for not going, because I'm neither heroic nor very brave, and because there's a total distinction between adventure in literature and adventure in real life. They're neither the same nor even the same in the after effects. But then, they were after something else bigger than that, weren't they? It's wonderful what even I think I could endure for some lure like that. Yes, I have no desire whatever to place myself in an awkward position just for the sake of adventure. Well, I wrote The Hobbit in 1937. I had already, ever since early youth, and certainly since undergraduate, had been slowly constructing and altering and fiddling with it, and had eventually produced a large legendary cycle of the supposed elder period in this world. The Hobbit, I wanted to write a fairly quick story, a bit of humor in it, and it was supposed to break away from that world and does to begin with, but it gets drawn back into it, doesn't it? And that's really the origin of The Hobbit. But of course, in the process of writing The Hobbit, it's a fairly long book even so, isn't it? It's a goodish narrative long. In the process of that, if you're a writer, an awful lot gets tied up. Your own present situation, your past, the things you would like to do, the things you have done, and so that it's simply full, of course, of memories for me. I don't think you get anywhere near the center of The Hobbit at all by discovering the ingredients. It's like stopping in the middle of eating a most delectable food and insisting on the chef coming and telling you all the things it's made of. It seems to me the soup's the thing and not the things that go into the cauldron. I always think this is an extraordinary illusion that you get anywhere when nearer the center. You can get nearer how the soup can have that flavor.
You don't get any nearer the point of why the flavor is pleasant and why people like it or why people come back for more of that soup. They don't come back because of some asparagus or some corn. They come back because they like the taste and the mixture. I could go on for hours telling you what things the Hobbit is made of, but it won't get you any nearer to where you can say why it amused you. It amused you just as much before you knew that and will go on amusing you. I hope even after you do know. As a matter of fact, one of the cardinal things in The Hobbit is one of the few adventurous periods I ever went through in my lifetime. I went as a member of a party of, I don't know whether there were 13 or 14 odd people, walking in Switzerland. We walked most of the way on our plain poor foots to the Interlaken, went through to Brig. We crossed many mountain passes and so on. We were humping out packs on our backs. We slept in the most extraordinary places. We had some narrow escapes from death, rather like the one with the rocks from the giants and so on. And I think that's why it really isn't the basic thing to be that journey is an actual personal experience. Altered, of course, we met no goblin. We met a lot of other things, hornets, for instance. If you've ever jumped in a hornet's nest when you are looking for a lost piton and had a whole host of hornets looking for you, you dive under a blueberry bush. Well, I did do some climbing and walking, you know, slipped in a crevasse and all that kind of thing when I was in Switzerland. I am not so completely sissy as I make myself sound. I started writing The Hobbit. Really, I can't remember quite why. Except, I suppose that one was ripe for trying to write a longer story than I'd done before. I tore the paper out because there might be something here before I put it back in the pile. You're not supposed to tear papers out of exam papers. Well, that's the flashpoint. I don't know how The Hobbit, what generated the name. You can think of all kinds of theories, but of course it was made up of linguistic things in my mind, but it seemed to fit. I then wrote, I suppose, what was the first chapter. I'm afraid I've lost, but I still preserved for a long time a page of the spidery scribble in which that was written before Gandalf even became called Gandalf. I got interested in this and at odd times, well, I was a busy man, you know, university official, conscientious lecturer, teacher. I used to carry on with it from time to time. I can't remember quite how many years it took in completing. It's finally the old basic thing which must have occurred often in literature the reluctant hero and the stay-at-home man having adventures he never expected to, and being not really basically altered in character, but very much altered in humor and experience by it. That's the basic thing, isn't it? So what's better than a wizard? I must say that I think the dwarves were rather a good invention. I don't think there's any precedent I can think of. Having a party of these people all coming in uninvited, I thought it was a good point. And the story, the essence, is for me the adventures of this little chap. Dragons I liked. Dragon hordes have always been in the back of my mind since a child. So obviously the end of the pilgrimage was to lead some time to a dragon's lair. The whole thing of a narrative of that length, you know, the end is not perfectly clear until you get there. And it picked up a lot of things on the way. The story is a small, fussy little middle-aged chap, man if you like. The bachelor, fond of his comforts, suddenly swept away, partly by an inner weakness that says yes, but mostly by the feeling of becoming a party of people who are going on an exploring expedition, their object being to recover their own wealth, which is now occupied by the dragon. And the story, in essence, is, for me, the adventures of this little chap on his way to this dragon and his horde, which he eventually reaches, the result of the quest and his return home. It's therefore called There and Back Again. That is the simple outline. I'd never even thought about publishers, I'm afraid. Have I told you the story before of how it actually became published? I typed it out, of course, and I think C.S. Lewis read it, and I think Miss Elaine Griffiths, 
who's now the chairman of the Faculty of English now read it, and they liked it. And it was from Miss Griffiths that it got in the hands of another young lady, Susan Dagnall, I think her name was, you'd have to verify that, who either then or afterwards became connected with Alan Arm Unwin. And that's how it got into the hands of the publisher at all. It was read by the Reverend Mother of the Cherwell Edge Convent, who had influenza and amused her. And I think it was through Susan Dagnall that it got in the hands of Stanley Unwin, who then read it to Rainer Unwin, who was then quite a young boy, a small boy. And I remember in one of the letters from Stanley Unwin, he said that Rainer said, don't read any more because I shall fall off the gate if you do so, because I shall laugh so much. It was purely accidental. I must say, I was extraordinarily fortunate in having been well connected with such a publishing house by such an accidental means. The simplest thing would take about a quarter of an hour. It was a mythology which I had been in process, and still am in process, of constructing. There's a passage in The Hobbit itself which speaks about the origin of the elves. I think it's in the chapter about flies and spiders. But with The Lord of the Rings, it's no longer just a casual reference to something that's in the mind. It's basic. Started about 1937 or 1938. I just concluded round about 48 or 49. Well, you must read the book. I mean, I can't give any better ideas than the book. I don't use the term goblins in The Lord of the Rings. I use orcs once in The Hobbit, I think. Because goblins is too tied up with medieval history and so on, it simply means a grotesque, of course. But as orc is a good word, I ought to spell O-R-K. In spite of everything I write, people still go on thinking that Middle Earth is some unknown planet. Middle Earth is simply an ordinary expression for that part of the globe which men inhabit. They don't know their literature very well because it's used by Scott. It is a perversion of the older Middle Earth. It means the inhabited parts in which human beings exist. Middle Earth extends right outside. Middle Earth is the whole of the inhabitable parts of the world, this world. I used it because in your putting over mythological stuff of that kind, it's desirable if you can, necessary if you can, to use words that are already in existence, which have a certain sense and are laden with a certain sense. And therefore I use dwarves and Middle Earth and elves and so on. You can't have everything absolutely strange at the outright. That's why I used Middle Earth. What do these people think Middle Earth is between reality and lunacy? The thing to his design, but which he's had the existence of first created minds and spirits, the demiurgic angelic spirits. Those of them who became enamored of this particular quarter are part of Aya partly because it was set for a particular drama in its own history, in the history of the universe, were permitted by him to take up their residence in our part of the solar system. It's called the Kingdom of Arda, the realm, where they appear as the valor, or powers. They're not gods, but, of course, you must have in this kind of narrative something that has the same emotive situation as the Olympic gods, and other gods in narrative. They do, of course, occupy a position like the gods in ancient myth, but they are created beings, appointed guardians of this world, and their chief was called in Elvish, Manway. He is referred to as the Elder King. His wife was Varda, who's apostrophized in the other language, Elbereth. They're there as a kind of background. They don't appear very much in the stories of the Third Age, of course, but the intervening mythological work consists of the coming of the two. They were not. They were spirits, but they could incarnate themselves at will and they very often took human form in my mythology simply because of the intense love they had of the promised children of God who were to come, who were outside of any design they were allowed to interfere with. At certain periods, the two rational, but incarnate, but related, kindred of the elves and men were to come. And they knew enough about them, and what they looked like, 
but didn't know when they were to come precisely. The elves came first, and on them the creator tried the experiment of serial longevity. On men, brevity. I dislike the sensation of being inebriated intensely. I mean the actual sensation, quite apart from a hangover. I've always fought against gas, since I dislike having my wits scattered or being irrational. I won't take gas, never have taken it, since I was able to exert my will. I will not be anesthetized. Love it. Oh yes. I think most of the objection to it is because people know so little about language. Of course it's very current in my church at the present time. So many people seem to be quite ignorant of the fact that kind of noise is only one of the many signs. It's only one form of language. You can attach meanings to other actions than wagging your tongue. For instance, to genuflect is much terser, sometimes much more expressive, than a word expressing homage. It's no good telling me that you can get used to genuflecting. You can get used to saying, my lord, or I honor you, just as well. To light a candle becomes a beautiful thing. To light a candle and then go away and leave it as a model of your aspiration. Fireworks you want? I like fireworks. Well, do you like fireworks? Any kinds that I've ever had the chance to see, which is not enough. I used to, when I was a small child, live near the reservoir in Edgebaston, where they used to have fairly frequent displays of fireworks. I could climb up into our little house and push the skylight up and see them. Anything that's good in one and two is nearly always bad at five thousand. Don't you think so? By making motor cars more and more numerous, more and more cheap, the actual user of motor cars is no longer able to do the things for which motor cars were made. All the advertisements for motor cars still, on the whole, appeal to most people's desire to get away, and you see a motor and a picnic hamper by the side of an untrammeled brook. But nowadays, before you can get to the brooks, the state roadmakers have smashed the brook and cut the trees down so that you can get there. I should have thought it's the roadmakers more than the motor car which I dislike. They really are ruthless and foolish. I suppose in a sense it's true, because I didn't put much of it in. It isn't quite true as, of course, as a matter of fact, there are references to God, either direct, in which he is called, the one, in one place, or by implication, as in the conversation between Gandalf and Bilbo and Frodo and what it was that was directing the finding of the ring, or in the Numenorean grace, which is said by Faramir. But, of course, if you mean religious practices, you don't get much, except perhaps, say, the elvish hymn to Elbereth. And that's partly, of course, a deliberate device. There are some things said, for instance, quite obviously. The Numenorean people of Minas Tirith of Gonda, for instance, obviously had no organized religion like our own, with a sort of Sunday set apart, that kind. They had become largely not so much necromantic, as in the way in which Egyptian culture had developed, which was necrological, there were sacred places, the tombs of the ancestors and so on. But that, of course, was because of the terrible events and actions in their own past, which are outside the story, which is reserved really for the downfall of Numena, which is one of the things I have written but shall publish. I would, but I think there's enough, isn't there really, wouldn't you say? It's quite enough to give the air of a fully organized world. Not only the geology is attended to, certainly, though actual geologists have found some faults in it, but the fact that they could take it reasonably at all means there's been some thought put into it. What people really want to know is a grammar, but I can give them more easily than a grammar the origins and process of the development of the phonetic structure. Yes, I could recite a declension now, if you really wanted one. Apart from that, it may be seen that it gives you an insight into the way in which the Lord of the Rings has grown up in,
and takes in a large part of earlier and unpublished literature, because the exact purport and tragedy and sorrow of the lament can't be understood unless one understood Galadriel's part in the far past. She had been one of the chief people of the elves and had joined the rebellious party that had departed from paradise forever, and was therefore under a ban that she could never return. And at the end she wishes that Frodo may at any rate find a short visit to paradise as a rest after his labours, and she says farewell. She had then nothing to expect, except to go on living in a world that was steadily fading. Those who have read the book will find she did eventually go back in the ship with Frodo. That was because of the special remission, because she was one of the chief leaders whose work had led to the downfall of Sauron. Also, she passed the great temptation when the ring was actually offered to her by Frodo. She rejected it, and for that she was released. Yes, I enjoyed doing the work. I've built more than one garden in concrete and everything else, but give me composing a thing like the Lord of the Rings for really exhausting laboring. I'd rather work, even when I was younger, six hours on concreting the lawn than writing a chapter. Well, that's a title I hastily invented long long ago, before the Lord of the Rings was published, in writing a letter to The Observer, to answer to one of Mr. Garvin's 92 notes. I said, all of this is told in the Silmarillion. But he managed to capture them and took them off into his great northern fortress of Thangorodrum. And then comes the great saga of how, a kind of Orpheus saga reverted, how a mortal man and the elf, Luthien, managed to get into Thangorodrum and managed to get hold of one of them, and the whole of the rest is the story of the fight and the fate of the Silmarils. If I have any attitude to life it must reflect the world I should have thought. All attitudes of life reflect the situation we find ourselves in. I don't know whether, branching from that, if we could, if one could go into another point and that is many people have tried either to allegorize or make various applications of the story. And, of course, as I've said, I think quite explicitly. The ring is simply an example of externalizing the lust for power. But that doesn't really work. Power in a narrative is only the thing that starts the wheels working, isn't it? What you want is a story. You aren't really interested in so and so's lust for power. But his lust for power starts a whole lot of events and heroisms and oppositions. It's a mechanism which starts a story. Now, what made the ring work? It's corrupting power very largely by its attempt to escape that by a back door. And really the whole constant interweaving opposition of men and elves you see is really a very long story, a very long story based most particularly on the differences in eternal life and unlimited serial life and death. You mention power. Is power evil? In one thing, power is a pure abstract. You either have the power to do it or you don't have the power to do it. In itself it isn't evil. You see evil on the good side, I mean it isn't just blacks against whites, or the goodies against baddies or whatever they call it in modern parlance. No, I mean Denethor is a complex character, and Boromir obviously is not. He's a sort of good fighting type of chap but he has his. Faramir is again. But Denethor is a very good example of what is going to come along in the dominion of men when the good and evil will be mixed in, not separated by mythology, but work this way or that way simply through human agents. It's awfully easy to be sort of critical and semi-philosophical and whatnot about writing after you've written it but you don't, at least I don't, write under these circumstances. I don't think anybody can write according to their theories. At least if they do it doesn't produce anything like the Lord of the Rings. Which I must say for me, it's so long ago since I wrote it, that I can now read it really as almost as if it was written by somebody else. I must admit it's damned exciting in places, and I often sometimes look back for a quotation and find myself still reading on. So that I, 
you will forgive the apparent vanity of saying this, but I don't think works of that kind come out of literary theory really. They come out of what you might call the heart, the emotional side, and what I should call the leaf mold of the mind, and say all the things you think you've forgotten. You have got to have known something to be able to forget it. It's not a negative. Most minds at a certain point in their career are in a way rather a rich soil, because they read and thought a good deal about things and forgotten. I can't work over much in the head. I admire people who can, who say they can go down and think out long chapters of either music or verse. I never have been able to work without a pen. Scribble, scribble, scribble. And although I have some calligraphical leanings rather than accomplishments, my writing becomes more and more illegible until finally only my son Christopher can read it and edit it. It comes beyond him. Well, when I'm in the process of writing, I have written very quickly, getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And then if I'm wise I go over it in ink before it becomes unintelligible, leaving out those things, those words, which I can no longer interpret. In fact there's one piece of manuscript that I've got somewhere where even now, after many years, I've never discovered what the word could possibly be. Then I discovered, much though I actually like handwriting, that the typewriter was a great boon to me. I think rather quickly in very elaborate long sentences, my digression. Sentences by me very largely consist of stuff in brackets. Ent is an interesting name. It's one of the many Old English words for giant. Particularly in Old English, they call for instance an ancient ruin of the past, which they didn't know the origin, enter, the work of the old, old construction of the ents. So it's a giant name and it seems in Old English logic it connects with stone. I don't know why I use that though, because they, the ents, are able to conquer stone, they can tear it up and so on. But they're trees. I feel a real kinship to them. I'm not happy without trees. Birch is my favorite, and perhaps the beech too. I planted, I remember, one beautiful one that I planted myself. It is now 15 years, 30 feet high and absolutely straight because it's been planted in the right place. I love trees, I don't know why. Yes, that's a sad thing. It's rather apropos to something we were thinking about before. It's a sad thing, tragic, but that's only one of the tragic necessities of the world. That's cutting timber, but where he goes really angry is cutting down trees and leaving them to rot on the floor. The recklessness and ruthlessness. Thought of the destruction of the forests of the world to make paper for the people to throw in the gutter. Knock them down without any further thought often totally unnecessarily. Yes, there's a good deal of that in the world. One regrets and laments various things. I can lament getting old, and I lament the particular fact that having been born into a country which has developed and changed very quickly and the population which has doubled since I was young, that I practically can't go back to any site which is even visibly similar. Mr. Lewis can go back to Northern Ireland and see the tree that was the first tree he ever called a tree. But I think that's all, isn't it? I'm sensible enough to realize that a lot of this is essential at any rate. It's not peculiar to our time. It's only that the multiplication table has come in now. It's faster because there are more people required. Dash it. Nobody in ancient England thought anything about oaks, trees, I mean they devastated the whole of the southeastern country for smelting, for building ships and so on. No, it's not a new thing. They're not a very common type in universities. Though I do know, I won't mention his name in public. I know a most perfect example of a university hobbit, both in size, appearance, and general sentiments. So they occur here and there in many contexts but they were fairly common in villages that are either agricultural or mainly agricultural and they're pretty common in England surely. They're not only agricultural though, you know.
when I was a sort of growing schoolboy and then an undergraduate, I used to love coming up in the local trains when the people were coming back from the works in Birmingham or getting further out towards Evesham there. It's delightful. Well that, as I told you, that is a childhood. There's nothing in the Lord of the Rings except that it's a foundation of one's feeling for trees, flowers and England generally. Oh yes, very hobbity of course. Some of the sagacious remarks and aphorisms come from the people I knew of course, yes. I'm rather dressed in the fashion of the day, rather like little Lord Fauntleroy, very unsuitable really. We used to hobnob with the farm children, the cowman's children and so on. They were very contemptuous. I can still remember they burnt a hole in me when I was young and I didn't hardly understand it. One little boy looked up at me and says, you're but a wench. I always had a great delight in people like that, excellent people. It was a dear old toothless hobbit you see at the sweet shop there. And also made all the simple, you know, dandelion wine, and all those sort of things. It was still sufficiently far away from all the great suburb Mosley was right on it. Bad hats? You get those in the country, don't you? I mean a thing like Bill Fernie who's a pretty well-known character. There isn't such a thing as magnificence in badness. It's a delusion. Milton really knew that, and he failed really to make it. You never see him. Everything you know about him is pretty caddish and low in the extreme. Mean. It's your imagination of this great dark shadow that makes it seem magnificent, terrible, but impotent. No, Satan's just the toad, isn't he? The toad in paradise lost listening behind the keyhole. That's about the psychological stature of an evil leader. Of course, there's another thing, yes, that is a power. People who've met some of the great characters get a sense of something which is nothing to do with them or their intellectual power. Yes, I wouldn't have liked to meet Sauron when his ring had been destroyed. But one does meet people like that. Fortunately the people I've met with this extraordinary willpower, which is quite unrelated to ideas, have nothing. Fortunately when I've met them they were fortunately not people with any particular desires, ambition or even sufficient intellect. This curious thing, will power, that as soon as you come into a room makes you unwilling to disagree, or offend or in any way oppose whatever they do, is a terrifying thing, because it's extremely exhausting to resist it. But fortunately I haven't met a person with sufficient intellect and will and knowledge to know what he wanted to use the will power for. Certainly in the university, you get a lot of people with very strong will power, and unfortunately they nearly always seem to be dissipated in puerile objects, merely stopping so and so having his say, that kind of thing.